Let's talk about how you attach the camera to the telescope. You're going to need two pieces of gear. You need what's called a T-ring. There's a, a standard which is 42 millimeter threads which is a little less than, than two inches. Two inches would be 48 millimeters. Uh, but it's one of the standards that are 42 millimeters typically used with telescopes and so what a t-ring does is on the camera side it looks like a lens to your camera so it's specific to your camera so you buy a t-ring for a Canon EOS or a t-ring for a, a Nikon and then it's going to have this t42 threads on the lens side and then that allows you to screw in various other pieces of equipment. So then you're going to need a, uh, a nose piece. And the nose piece is going to have that T42 T-threads on it to thread into the T-ring. And then it's going to have whichever size nose on it that fits in your telescope's focuser. So those are typically either one and a quarter inch or or two inches. There's some that are even larger, three inches and, and whatnot, but most amateurs are going to be an inch and a quarter or two inch. If your focuser accepts two inches, then definitely use a two inch nose piece. Don't use the, the two inch to 1.25 inch adapter and then get a 1.25 inch nose piece because for a DSLR even a crop sensor, you pretty much need that whole 42 millimeters of opening to get your image circle from your telescope, all of it, onto your camera sensor. So if you use the 1.25, you're going to have some vignetting and you're going to waste some of that light that your telescope is providing. Similarly, on uh, a CCD camera, except that you don't need the T-ring, it's typically going to have threads right on the, the CCD. It's probably going to come with a nose piece, or at least they're going to tell you what type of a nose piece that, that you need. And they mention here back focus. So if you look at a scope that's made for visual, it's typically made to work with a diagonal and an eyepiece. So if you unfold that diagonal, if you think about the light path, it goes to the mirror or the prism in the diagonal and then up to the bottom of the eyepiece. If you unfold that so it's a straight line behind the telescope, that's where the sensor of your camera is going to need to achieve prime focus. So it may be quite a bit back from where you, you might think it would be, and so you might need extension tubes, either T-thread or, or two-inch uh, extension tubes to move the camera back to where you can achieve focus with, with your focuser. So let's get into some of the actual deep sky imaging. Um, so again, Dennis came up with this great list here of the 6F program. Find the object, focus, frame, follow, film, and finish. So we'll talk about most of those in some introductory detail here. So finding objects in the sky, if you have a go-to mount, certainly use that. Just be aware that, as in visual, how accurate that go-to is is going to depend on how accurate your, your polar alignment is. How accurately did you point the telescope at true north versus magnetic north? And how accurately did you set the polar scope and, and line that up and is the scope level and all of that thing. So your go-to is going to get you near an object. You're still going to have to zero in in some way using a finder scope or plate solving or some other technique. So just be aware of that. Planetarium software is great for both planning. A lot of them now have actual artwork of the deep sky objects in them so you can zoom in and, and you can program in your your telescope and camera parameters so it's it'll give you a, a box that's your field of view and then you can 
see exactly how that deep sky object uh, can be framed in your field of view. I use one of the free ones, Stellarium. There's others that they can also be connected to drive your your telescope and do the go-tos and whatnot. In terms of planning, what objects you want to look at? What are what are in the night sky? What objects are up high? Uh, which is always easier than down low due to more atmospheric tur turbulence closer to the horizon. I've listed a couple websites here that will, you can tell it your location and your time zone and, it, and what type of objects you want to look at and it will list them. They tend to have, these two tend to have slightly different lists so I like to look at them both. I find Cal Sky a little bit more convenient in that it gives a lot more of the common names for the objects not just the NGC number but again they both have different lists so it's it's a good idea to, to check them both as I mentioned your go-to is probably not going to be bought on so you'll need to learn to star hop to find your object or at least have a, a nice finder with a wide field of view that'll help you zero in on it or if you're more advanced in using computer control then you can do plate solving and that's the method that that I use I've actually never so far learned to star hop because I'm totally dependent on on plate solving so the computer tells the camera to take a picture and then it figures out where in the sky that is actually pointing and then it sends a correction signal to the mount and that uh, that process repeats until the uh, you, the object that you told the scope to go to is exactly centered in your field of view. A lot of these objects are dim so you typically want to take a if you're using a DSLR a high ISO shot so you can see what's in the frame. I do a 5 or a, typically a 10 second at ISO 12800 and that's also what I use for plate solving just so you can see stars and in, in images without waiting for a long exposure. The monthly magazines, uh, astronomy magazines are also good choices for figuring out what uh, targets to to take pictures of. And list also here the 100 best astrophotography targets book that has for each month a list of targets that you want to you want to take advantage of when you're beginning you want to pick some easy and by easy we mean they're bright they're big in your field of view and again higher in the sky is always going to be easier in terms of a crisper image no jaggies uh, easier to auto guide which we'll talk about later so higher in the sky is always better. So, you know, 45 or 50 degrees or, or higher is, is a good choice, especially when you're beginning. So some of examples of things that could start out with, here's the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, here's M31 Andromeda. The Triangulum Galaxy. and the ever popular flame on the left and horse head on the right nebula. That's an example of something that visual observers probably have never seen, the horse head nebula. It's just uh, too dim, but with a camera and long exposures then you can you can see it. <laughs> 